Judy Bueno Año met her boyfriend, John Gentry, and the women who worked at her beauty salon at a Pensacola, Florida restaurant. They gathered to present one of the employees with a pendant in honor of her birthday. As the dinner was finished and the party wore down, Judy suggested that John go to the liquor store for some champagne so they could continue celebrating elsewhere. As night fell, the streets grew quiet. But the silence would be shattered in an instant. Police and rescue raced to the scene. Gentry was rushed to the hospital, shrapnel embedded in his back. At first, investigators weren't sure if the explosion was due to mechanical failure or an attempt on Gentry's life. But even a cursory look at the crime scene revealed the blast to be no accident. It came from the trunk, an unlikely place for an explosion of that magnitude. Because bombings are a federal offense, Pensacola police notified the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. By the extent of the blast, ATF agents estimated two sticks of dynamite were used, rigged to the taillights by yellow and orange wire. Gentry was lucky to have escaped with his life. As the ATF investigated the scene and the crime photos, Pensacola police sought to find out who would benefit from Gentry's death. That task fell to Detective Ted Chamberlain. What we usually do is we look into an insurance policies of the victim. And that's what we did with Gentry. And we looked into and we found he did have a large insurance policy on him. The beneficiary was Judy Bueno Año, Gentry's girlfriend. But that wasn't surprising. The two were starting a business together. By itself, the information meant nothing. Chamberlain needed more to go on. The ATF found it. They traced the dynamite to a man in Alabama, a very close friend of Judy Bueno Año. By now, Gentry was out of intensive care. Detectives took the opportunity to talk to him about what happened, to let him know that Judy Bueno Año was the main suspect. Gentry found it difficult to believe, but then he began thinking about it. He said, you know, uh, when I'm staying over there at Judy's house, I get, I, she was giving me these pills, uh, vitamins, to make me feel better, and he said, I kept getting sick. He said, so I quit taking them, and then I felt better. He said, and I took them again and got sick again. Gentry had been so ill, he'd spent time in the hospital. There, he recovered completely, though his doctor wasn't sure what was wrong with him. Once Gentry returned home, he relapsed. Finally, he stopped taking the vitamin pills and his health returned. He felt his days of illness were behind him. And then his car blew up. Sensing a connection, the detective asked Gentry if he'd saved any of the capsules. As a matter of fact, he had. They were supposedly a popular vitamin C supplement. Chamberlain sent them to the lab for analysis. Finding out what something isn't is easier than finding out what it is. The process of elimination began with a comparison of the capsules with vitamin C. It proved there was not a speck of the vitamin in the capsules. That discovery alone ramped up the suspicion that the pills were poisoned. But what was in them? The substance in the capsules was dissolved and tested. Some tests analyzed its chemical makeup, others measured the wavelengths of light it absorbed. By comparing these results with a database of chemicals, the compound was identified. The capsules were found to contain a substance called paraformaldehyde. 
it has no known medical use. In fact, it's considered a class three poison, which means it's moderately toxic. John Trestrail of the Blodgett Poison Control Center is a poisoning expert. According to him, if murder was the motive, paraformaldehyde wasn't the best choice. When it breaks down to formaldehyde, which we know is used to preserve bodies, uh, is very irritating. It, it wouldn't be a very good poison to pick for homicidal reasons. It'd be more irritating, you know, irritating to the eyes, irritating to the respiratory tract. And I suppose in chronic exposures, we know formaldehyde can cause cancer. Gentry's story, bolstered by the tampered pills and the explosion, gave Chamberlain ample grounds to obtain search warrants for Bueno Año's home and beauty salon. At her house, they found more vitamin capsules. Basket. Oh, I got something. In her son's closet, Orange they found wire. wire that resembled the wire used to blow up the car. Look at this. Got a wire here. So we sent that off to the lab, and they sent us back pictures of the wire and the color coding and striations of the wire. Take one taken from the piece of the bomb that was gone and the one from the boy's room and you put them together, it was just like matching up ballistics on bullets. I mean, they looked exactly alike. And that was real good evidence. Hi, I'm Detective Robert Beasley. This is an investigation. While one group of officers searched the house, another group was at work collecting chemicals from Bueno Año's salon. For Judy Bueno Año, paraformaldehyde would be a poison of opportunity. The chemical is used in beauty salons as a disinfectant. With evidence of the bomb and the poison, police had ample grounds to arrest her on suspicion. The bombing made her a suspect in a federal crime. The ATF's jurisdiction stretched beyond Florida to all 50 states. Having failed at both poisoning and blowing up her lover, Bueno Año seemed like a two-time loser. But as investigators checked her background, they began to suspect that she may have just been in a slump.